Yeah, that's what you do. It was a great, great time for us just to watch them grow and stuff. And you got to get back in the swing. Uh, Mike, we got guests in the house. Love, love, love when guests show up, especially to an odd time church, 8.30 on Sunday, Tuesday night. And uh, uh, you guys were glad to have. Just lift your hand. We want to bring all three of you some bread. Uh, it's homemade bread. Scott, Alyssa, and Samantha, wave at me. Guys, thanks for coming. Thank you. There you go. There you go. Uh, give them all three. Just, there you go. Bless them. Amen. Anyone else first time here on a Sunday morning? Your first time. How you doing? What's your name? Amber. Amber, you got a little crew here with you, don't you? Good. Yeah, give them two loaves. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Good to have you. Anyone else first time here? Oh, back here in the back. Who you got way back there? Thanks for coming today. Man, I'm just kind of looking for... Surveying the crowd here. Amen. Kind of looking you over before we get into this. Have you spent a, we got 110 teenagers out at the camp this week, and uh, it's been good. Uh, two funerals again yesterday, so life has not slowed down. I was wondering, when the grandkids are gone, are you able to take care of stuff and get to the hospitals and do what we do? But good to have all of you here. No other guests. Are you done, Cheryl? <laughs> now I don't often would do this but I'm going to do it this morning uh, Tommy would you bring uh, Henry and Renee and I, the, I don't know if Jan's here up here to the third row for me I, I, got, I can't have too many seats today. but the Havards aren't here and I that's probably the first time in 50 years <laughs> Brother Havard's always here so this tells me I'm expecting to see them in the north campus that's just how I do. When I don't see you here, I expect to see you at the other campus. Henry, thank you. That's the closest you've been to altar in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you you got to have a little relationship with somebody before you can say something like that. I like Henry. <laughs> Amen. Henry, I tried to get my grandson over to your pond. I heard I could slip back there, but I left it alone. I appreciate you so much, sir. You're a kind man. You let me drive a Chevrolet a while back. And I hadn't got a... Hadn't got, it was an honor. It was an honor. I ain't lying, it was an honor. That, that car was bad to the bone, boy. You know, I, I, uh, I saw a little movie last night, and it fired me up, and I, I hit the highway, and this Ford and Chevrolet truck were trying to race, and I, and I literally, this is what I thought, y'all get out of my way. And I, I blew both of them out of the way, and they both trying to catch me. Then I get here this morning, I got to get saved again. <laughs> I just couldn't help myself, man. I said, y'all just get on out. Y'all quit that monkeying around. Let me show you what a car can do. Anyway, I got to quit. Y'all get out of here. Y'all give the band a hand. Congratulations to Rob and Jennifer. Grandparents again. That's a good thing, man. Amen. I understand that Pat and Cindy going to have another little boy popping in here. Grandparents. Everybody getting old. Not you, Cindy? Huh? I said that. I didn't say you were having another baby. <laughs> I left that alone. That'd be, they're my neighbors. It's like, again, there's certain folk, they're my, Lord bless the children. And our wonderful teachers. Thank you guys so much for taking care of these kids. They're a great bunch. Got your Bibles. Those watching BeholyWild.tv also. Open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 19. It's going to be a different message this morning. I, I'm really hoping a lot are watching us by way of holywild.tv and uh, looking forward to getting to the other campus too to share. 
I, after 20 something years of pastoring, you know, you get to a place in my life where you know, one of our goals was to pay everything off. We got it paid off. And now you have to find new goals in your life to keep pressing forward. And then, again, like I mentioned, I've done 12 funerals in the last two months. Uh, you say that sounds like a lot. It, it, it's quite a few because some of those were dear friends of mine. And as I'm, I'm getting, getting older, as a grandparent, other things like that, and hiring David and Joseph, you know, there have been people ask me, well, Pastor, did you hire them? Why, why'd you, well, I need, we needed help. We needed help with our youth and also to have to be, get to mentor them, to have Josiah with us. I, I see Diane Spurlock who takes care of uh, the jewels, the ladies here. So what I wanted to do this morning was really kind of, kind of talk to you. Uh, about, I, I, I hit a place this week where I was insensitive in some of my thinking, and I said some things to somebody that was hurtful, and, and then afterward I got on to myself about it. I said, why do you say that? You're the pastor. You know, you don't have no business hurting people's feelings, and I didn't mean to hurt them. I just, I'm insensitive. I'm a man. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and throw that under the bus. All right. And uh, so I, I, I kind of got along. I'd already done a sermon for today. I'd already had my message done. And then I sat down, and, and I began to chew on myself a little bit. And I said, no, you need, to, you need to reevaluate why you do what you do. Why are you a pastor? And so this morning I want to talk to you about a pastor's reward. So I only have one scripture for you. This ought to shock you. And we may, re, may, may review some others, but pretty much one. So are you comfortable? Again, I found myself at a time needing to remind me of why I do what I do. In so doing, I want to remind you. It's not an uncommon thing for me to do a funeral and people to walk out saying, this happened yesterday. Uh, and I know that Joseph and, uh, can verify it where people said, I've never heard anything like that before. That's the best funeral I've ever been to. And I get shocked every time I hear that because all I'm trying to do is lay out biblical truth to people to help them understand why we are here and then where we are going. And then to in my own head, it's like every time I do a memorial service, something new kind of comes over me about eternity and, again, why we're here. Paul said in Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, he said, After all, what gives us hope and joy? And what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It's you. That's what he said. It's you. And this is what really put the nail in the coffin for me. Uh, not the nail in the coffin. That's not, that's not the best thing to say. This is what really uh, cranked my tractor here was this thought that you are my reward. And that you have rewards also. And we always talk about putting rewards in heaven and why do we need rewards and all that. And I was talking to my pastor on the way here and I said, you know, it could be that it's not a monetary thing we're going to see in heaven. It's not something financial the way we think on earth. It could be that our reward is the people that we connect with on earth that we've led to Christ, that know Jesus, that, that they make that trip with us. This could be our reward. And then Paul goes on to say, yes, you are our pride and joy. Now, it took 20-something years now, Pastor, and for me to get to a place where I don't sound arrogant in saying this, that you are my pride and joy. You are my reward. What goes on in my life? Why do my reward in life is you. You all I get. So you better straighten up. <laughs> Father, thanks for the word. Help the preacher share his heart. Help us remind ourselves that we have rewards here and rewards coming. I thank you for the treasures on earth, but more so for the treasures we send home. I thank you for the kingdoms here, but I thank you more for your kingdom. God, I ask that it come in Jesus' name. And everybody sit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. We just sang a song about Jesus coming again. You know, I remember way, way back in the day, I'd hear somebody say, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will, many will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound. You didn't know I knew that, did you? 
Huh? And they do, they do that three-part or four-part or whatever, the southern quartets, you know, that I got stuck with after I got born again because I had to get rid of all my Eagles and Alice Cooper albums and stuff, you know. And, and so I had to listen to the Hensons, and I'd hear stuff like that. I said, dear Lord, you've got to help me. But I remember hearing that song, and, they, and it just resounded in me that there are people that believe that Jesus is coming again. I'm one of them. I believe he's coming again on a white horse. I believe the trumpets will sound. I believe the skies will open. We all believe in this, but we kind of differ on the when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, at what place it, uh, uh, persecution it could be going on. But to the leadership and the ministry leaders of this house, those that are taking care of the children and the youth, that I pray that eventually will get hold of this message, and to those that are leading others, I would say to you, use your ministry to build the people. Use your ministry to build the people. Your giftings that you've got, use them. Live as close as possible to your people. When you're reaching people, you've got to connect with them, live close to them. I, I want to give you some nuggets from a book that's over 70-something uh, years old. Charles Jefferson, in his book on quiet hints to growing preachers, 1901 is when he wrote this. I found it, I found it extremely uh, important even for today. In his thoughts on near to men, near to God, which is Jefferson's advice on how to be a good pastor to your congregation. And this is what I had to do. I had to go back and remind myself why I'm doing what I'm doing. Why do you get aggravated with people? Why do you get frustrated about this thing? He said this. And by the way, he made a statement, isolation is fatal. In, in, in my life, there are times I believe that solitude becomes a momentary reward. For me to have solitude on my bike or in my car or just have being alone for a little, but it's only momentary. I can't stay uh, alone, alone for long. I got to get back with the people. He said, knowing people is the preacher's first and most important business, knowing them. It is the man in the street whom the preacher must know, and if he does not know him or other, uh, no other sort of knowledge will make him a successful preacher. If a preacher really desires to serve his people, he will not count time lost which is spent in their company. The closer he comes to them, the larger his opportunity to give them what they need. What they are fearing and hoping, feeling and thinking, enjoying and suffering, loving and hating, reading and dreaming. All this can become known to him only as he comes in contact with them. And to know these things is more important than to know nine-tenths of all the books you can teach. It wasn't college that taught me how to be a pastor. It was you. You taught me how to be a pastor. Your hurts, your pains, your disappointments, your joys, your successes, they all taught me how to be a pastor. It's what I've gone through. I mean, I look here and see Toby. Toby and I have been friends for over 30 years now. He was in my youth group. And I look back and I see people and I, I, I remember the, the growth spurts and getting with them. And yet I watch today's pastor, maybe this will go out, but I've seen this, where they isolate themselves. They disconnect from the people they come to. They're great pulpiteers. They can move you with the word. They can challenge you. They can get you sobbing at the altar. But then they're gone from you. They, they slip out the back. They, move, they, they tell you, you know, if I get too close to you, the more familiar you are with me, the more you're going to de-appreciate de me. You're not going to like me. I found the opposite to be true. My mother has been my mom for 56 years. We're very familiar with each other, and I still love her. Amen. Amen. I found that if the more real you find somebody is in your life, you know, the, the, the more you understand that this is not a bad thing. You've heard me say this over and over. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So as I'm speaking this today, first I'm saying it to you for you to understand me, David, Joseph, the other ministers in here, Ronnie himself, Diane, others I see, Marie stepping up, all those that are doing things. But also everybody here, I don't care if you leave them, a motorcycle ministry or what, you've got to get with the people. You've got to connect. And the people need to get with us. You shouldn't be afraid of me. I hear people tell me that I, they, I intimidate them. What? Man, my, my grandson brought me to my knees. <laughs> Just one little punch. You ain't, there's, no, there's no need to that. There's a shepherd's heart that has to be formed. I know I teach you about being a lion and stepping out and ruling and reigning, but Jesus talked about the heart of a shepherd, that a shepherd has to look after those around them. I want you to start out as sheep, but I want you to grow into being lions. But first, there has to be a shepherd's heart in the house. In the nature of the case, pastors do many things because there are many things that need to be done. When I first got into this, I actually heard people say, well, you only work one day a week, and it's only for an hour let me say this to you this is my vacation right here 
When I finally get here on a Sunday or Tuesday or Wednesday, it's like I'm breathing again. It's, it's like this is good stuff here. It's all the other things you've got to deal, deal with. I would tell anyone who wanted to be a pastor these days, you must have some understanding of, of administration, finance, social media, cultural trends, local news, national news, politics, social issues, ideology trends. And they need to know something about history, literature, science, and sports. This thing is vast that you've got to get hold of. I had no idea idea about that but I get around people and I realize I got to broaden my thinking above all else the pastor must be a man of the word he has to know the word love the word immerse himself in it so that when he stands up on Sunday Tuesday Wednesday he has a message from God from to his people I don't want to stand up and just give you a sermonette I want you to enjoy and say you know what that was exactly for me Amen. walking out of here saying Boom, man, he got me on that one. Do you know one of the things I noticed about Jesus, and I would hear this in college, you need to be so full of God that anybody that's got sin in their life is uncomfortable around you. So we'd pray, we'd fast, we'd build ourselves up. We would walk around stoic and act like, you know, we're better than everybody. That's self-righteous. Here's what I find. Sinners were comfortable in the presence of Jesus. Women of the world would gather around him and spill their guts to him. Not to nobody else, but to him. They would share. There was something about being in his prayer. And it told me that, you know, the church world is, is kind of, we've got this thing backwards. We're driving people away with our attitudes and how, we, how we've done things. But as, as, you know, there's nothing perfect about this place. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But I want to tell you, pastors have a lot to do. So much that a man has to make some decisions. What will be important to him? There are essentials versus the incidentals. There are times in your life what's important to you is it really is just kind of incidental compared to, to a, a two-pound, 12-ounce baby in, in the hospital or a woman whose uh, who's appendix just ruptured and, and you're upset because you can't find your cat and you call me? Do you not know I hate cats? Don't tell your sister, okay. Uh, you have to discern on what is really important at the time and what's not so important. Same way in your own life. The ministry is about people. At some point, the pastor has to make a basic decision. Either you use your people to build your ministry or you use your ministry to build the people. Let me tell you, how many of you first met me at a funeral? Lift your hand. Several of you. I, I can go on all day long about, and there were people that made a decision at a funeral to join this church. It's, it, it may sound morbid to you, but I found out it's my ministry. Uh, weddings, I, I don't mind doing weddings, but they don't last as long as funerals. I hadn't had one get back up yet. But I'm still working on it. Can I get an Amen. Still stay on, but but it's it's your min whatever your ministry is. If it's to broken people, you minister to them. It ain't about building up uh, your, your kingdom. It's about building up the kingdom of God by using the giftings that God gave you. Again, I go back to Thessalonians. Paul said, "For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when He comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy." Jesus is coming, and when he does, I pray that, that the rewards of 30-something years of serving God and the years that you serve God, you're going to look around and you're going to get connected. In these words, we have a powerful glimpse into Paul's heart. There were two parts here. I, you've heard me say over and over, it's what we do here is going to matter there. But there's a here and there's a there. Let's talk first about the there. There's a heavenly coronation, if you would, to the believers. They were his hope. Why you do this? Because I got this hope that Fred and Frida are going to get it together. I got this hope that life is going to be a little bit better. I have this hope that this child is going to get healed. Because he kept thinking about what God was going to do through them. They were his joy, both now and in heaven. They were his crown. The word refers to a wreath of, of leaves given to the winner of an athletic contest. He means that his reward in heaven would be the pleasure of seeing all those new believers standing with him. I don't, again, as I'm moving through life, I realize there's going to come a time when we make that transition. I'm, we've not been on the other side yet, but I've got to believe what Paul is saying is right. That what we've done here is going to matter. 
you showing up in church, you giving, you loving, you caring, that's going to matter. Think about it. Is anybody going to be in heaven who will come up to you and thank you for having a part in giving out the word of God? Have you given your support to missions? Have you, if you have, someone you have never known, someone from the other side of the earth may come up to you and thank you for your support. They will thank you for being interested in getting the word of God because the word reached them and enabled them to be saved. That church is going to be a part of the reward that we'll get in heaven. We have to recognize that. It's a wonderful hope to look forward to the time when Jesus takes the church out of this world. He's going to yank us out of here. I, when it happens, uh, it's going to be chaotic down here. I'd rather be going up. Amen. Amen. It is even more joyous to know that someone who trusted Christ because of your witness will go along with you to meet the Lord. Second is the earthly celebration. You are our pride and joy, not just in heaven, but right now you are the most important thing in the world to us. Toby, you sent me a message yesterday. said, love you, Pastor. I ain't heard from you in months. But that just brightened my day. Brightened me up. Three words, love you, Pastor. Right out of the blue. You never know what that does for somebody. You're my reward. It's our reward when we do things like that for one another, when we, when we build one another up, when we don't forget. And I'm not here to pump the preacher up. I'm here to tell you, this is, this, you are my, when I get to heaven, and I'm thinking, God, we got to get a few more. We got, we got to pack this place for a reason. Amen. To keep feeling. Listen, you are my pride and my joy. We think about you night and day. We pray for you. We never stop telling others. That, that my mind never really, until I go to sleep, even when I go to sleep, I think about the people in this house and what's going on in this church. And, 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 and God, how can I help? What can I do? Every new parent understands what Paul means when, when, when that baby is born. You can't wait to tell the good news. You have pictures and statistics, and people want to know the length and the weight and the, and the eyes and this, and stories about how he has daddy's chin or, or she has mother's eyes and how smart they are already at age two months. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the doctor says. You know they smiled at you first. It was gas. He's the smartest. She's the prettiest. This is the cutest baby you've ever seen. And you've got pictures to prove it. That's exactly how Paul felt about the Thessalonians. Even though he was separated from them, and even though he couldn't return anytime soon, they were always going to be on his heart, always in his thoughts and prayers. Love people. To David and Joseph and the ministers in this house, I'd say love people. Love them. Love the people whom God has called you to. Those kids. Again, I, I look at several in here that were my kids at one time. I understand those kids. Oh, my God. You know them a little bit. Tomorrow you'll know them better. The day after tomorrow they'll be like family to you. Before long, people in your ministry and in this house will be like flesh and blood. They'll be that close. You'll connect that way. No doubt they will sometimes vex you and concern you. They'll confound you the same way children do, and you will sometimes exasperate them the way parents sometimes exasperate their own children. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was, I think, in his 30s when he was murdered. He was, one, he was a great theologian, a German theologian during the time of Hitler. He made a statement that I find absolutely true. He once remarked that churches where all illusions are shattered. Let me say that again. He remarked the church is where all illusions are shattered. An illusion is what you thought it was going to be. You had this grandeur idea. When I got born again, I thought y'all were the most perfect people in the world. I, I, I wore rose-colored glasses into the church. My, I, the blood washed over me. My mouth cleaned up. My brain was working right. I was thinking about heaven all the time. I'd come into church. I'd lift my hands on the front row with my skull ring in my back pocket. I was loving on Jesus. I'd look behind me, and there'd be people back there chit-chatting. Thank God there was no cell phones back in that day. I, would, I, I, I thought the church was the most powerful thing that there ever was. I still believe that. But when Bonhoeffer said, this is where illusions are shattered. I actually told a funeral group yesterday that I was raised up around a bunch of bootleggers, and I found out that the bootleggers had it better together than the Baptist. <laughs> At least they acknowledged each other in the liquor store. <laughs> on, 
So I see the church world, and we come into it, and, and we, we get this grandiose idea that the pastor's going to be this way, and, and the people going to be that way. It's not that way. It is where things are shattered. You, you come into this thing, and, and, and you find out that this one is, you know, they, they're not married, and, and they're having children, and this is happening. And you sit back and go, well, now hang on, I want a perfect church. And I've met pastors this way, and they try to make people do this and do that. I started backing away, and I said, God, let mercy reign in this house. Let grace cover these people. God, until they figure this thing out, I, I, can't, I can't make them do this. The medical world is doing that. You tell them if they get married, they're going to lose this money over here, and they can't make it in life. And I, and I, I have to marry people secretly. To, to, I, I, I'm okay, I'm letting the cat out of the bag. i got to do things that's a little <sighs> shady. I'm a scandalous saint, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and I see this thing going on, and I say, God, you got to help me because sinners were so comfortable around Jesus. And, 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 and then I asked myself, I said, Lord, I want to be more like him. I, I, I don't want people to have to keep living in sin and falling in addictions and doing this, that, and the other. But yet I, I know I struggle. This is where people's illusions get shattered. But this is what I know, and I'll say it again. It's the only thing I know that's floating. It's the only thing I know that's real. It's the church. It's God's people coming together with all their problems. And I look at you and I say, God, they're my reward. Each one of you have rewards. Each one of you have led somebody, touched somebody, given finances towards something that meant something. You forgot what you've done. But one day when we get there, we're going to see our rewards and what we've done. Is Christ in you the hope of glory? When I see a, a man struggling with alcohol addiction, but I know that he, knew, he knows Jesus, I say to myself, that's Christ in you. He's the hope of glory. There's hope in that man. When I see that woman struggling because her picker's broken and she keeps picking the wrong man and it keeps messing up her life, and I say to myself, Lord, there's hope in that woman. Christ in her is the hope of glory. I have hope that somehow this glory means in the ever after. From now on, there's hope in these people. It's also Christ in you and among you. And when I look at this church and the way it is, this messy, glorious gathering, amen, it's hope here. There's no other hope that I know of than in this house. Amen. It's got to be in the house of God where people start putting it together. And we as, as pastors, you know, and people ask me, they do. They, they, they come to me. You think Joseph's going to pastor the church over there? You think David's going to pastor the church over there? Pastor, they're not like you. My God, I hope they're not like me. When I die, let me die. Don't resurrect another one like me. I'm a mess. Amen. This, this, this. But, but I don't know. Let me be honest with you. I don't know what these two men are, are going to do. I don't know what God's going to have in their lives. I didn't bring them here to take my place. Amen. That's not. There, there'll be a place for them. They already got a place. They just grow into it. Amen. So we, we just grow. I don't know if I'm here four years, 10 years, 15. Whenever God decides to take me. But one of the things for sure, you do enough funerals, your mortality starts coming into light. You start realizing you ain't going to be here forever. You know, every time you have to lift your, pull your leg up, <laughs> strike your leg, you realize it ain't working like it used to. Mm -hmm. Love people. Love people. We have our good days. We have our bad moments. We, hey, listen, you can have a bad moment, but that don't mean you got to have a bad day. Amen. So we have our good days. We have our bad moments. We doubt and worry and fret and fuss and question. We, we rejoice and we exalt and we glory uh, and glorify God together. Christ is there in all of it. Sometimes that's where you see him best. And so I say enjoy all of it. The good, the bad, the happy, the sad, the positive, the negative. Uh, Ecclesiastes reminds us there's a time and a season for everything. What matters most in life is simply this, people. If we stand back and we look at this passage, it challenges us to think about eternal values. Think about someday Jesus is going to come again. It's really going to happen. Oh, no, it ain't. We've been, been saying that. No, it's really going to happen. Jesus, he didn't just leave you here alone to, to, to forget it. He never forgot about you. He is literally coming back again. Amen. And he's going to bring saints with him, and all those that have left are going to come back. Hey, Pastor, how's all that possible? I don't know. I don't know how an aspirin heals a headache. But when I got one and my prayers ain't working, a BC powder help you come back strong. 
We differ on the details of when he's coming back, but most believers agree that he is. But we are united on the main truth that our Lord will return to this earth. Paul himself speaks of standing in the presence of the Lord when he comes. When he comes, I will be standing. That leads me to ask a very personal question. What will you have to show for your life when you stand before Jesus? Oh, I know. A good job, a college degree, money in the bank, lots of friends, large reputation, successful career, uh, uh, the, the praise of others. If that's all we've got to show for our years on planet Earth, then we must shift our priorities. Sooner than you think, you'll be lying in a box six feet underground with grass growing over your head, and all the things of this life won't matter at all. Someone else will have your money. They'll have your job. They'll have our fame. Our fame is going to fade. Our glory will disappear, and everything we own will belong to others. We will eventually be forgotten except by those people who stumble on our gravesides a hundred years if Jesus tarries from now and say, I wonder who this guy was. Only two things in this world are eternal, the Word of God and people. The Word is eternal. People are eternal. So it only makes sense to build your life around those things that are going to last forever. The Word of God will last. People will last. Everything else is going to disappear. Whenever we are faced with a major decision, we ought to ask ourselves, what difference will this make in 10,000 years? You know, most of the things we worry about, we're concerned about, won't matter in three weeks, let alone three months or three years. We focus on the trivia, and we forget to pursue the eternal. But 10,000 times, 10,000 years from now, you'll still be glad you invested in the life of Christ. You'll still be glad that you spoke into somebody's life. You'll still be glad you made that phone call. You'll still be glad you sent that email. You'll still be glad you sent that text and connected with somebody. My pastor told me on the way here that he led, uh, he, he works in, uh, my pastor's one of them fixer-upper kind of people, if you don't know that. He not only preaches, but he fixes houses up. He stores houses in old St. Louis and, and one of the main guys that ran with Arnold Palmer uh, for, for over 20 years helped buy up all the golf courses and stuff he's a 40 something year old young millionaire pastor led him to the Lord last week and he said the only thing I desire to do right now is disciple that man he said I just want to help he asking questions he's got to know he said this is what important to me to get back to evangelism to reach people for Jesus Amen. that's what's important the only investments that will last forever are the investments we make in Christ. Your future may be secure as far as this world is concerned. Your investments may be growing 15% a year. Your children may all turn out good. God bless you. Amen. Your marriage may last for 50 years. God double bless you. I did a woman's funeral, uh, a man's funeral yesterday, and her and her husband had been married 60, 64, 65, 68 years, something like that. Amazing amount of time. She was 81. And she looked at me, and after church, she said, Pastor, I've been a good Lutheran my whole life. I don't know what a good Lutheran or a bad Lutheran is. She said, but I think I want to come to your church. And then she looked at me with the sweetest of eyes and said, I, I want to go somewhere where they don't gossip. <laughs> I wanted to break her heart right there. And said, ma'am, don't come to our place. But if she does, will you do the best you can? <laughs> Come on, will you? Will you do the best you can? There are people out there that want the real thing. They really want it. They're tired of just religion. They want Jesus. Amen. What, what of the Lord Jesus when he comes? What do you have invested for the day? When, when everything earthly is left behind and there will be nothing left at all, no one here will ever regret giving your heart to Jesus, offering him the very best that you have, serving the Lord with all your heart, sharing the gospel with others. This phrase was said over and over by my Bible college president. He would say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I was in my early 20s when I'd hear him say that. He'd say it over and over, only one life. And when you're in your early 20s, you think, well, man, I got a long time. It was over 30 years ago now. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. It resonates inside me. The only thing you can take to heaven is someone else. Everything else is going to get left behind. So let's get a big crowd and take them with us. Can I get an amen? amen. Let me close with a few thoughts here. We have a great church. 
I mean, we got two wonderful congregations. We got a peripheral outside this building of thousands of people. That's why you wonder, what Pastor, you doing funerals with people? I don't know. That's right. You don't know. But over 30 years, there's a peripheral that's gone on outside this place that we connect people with. And we use that ministry to build people and to keep lifting it up. Again, to Joseph and David, you've come to a great church. You know, I, I didn't try to con overly convince you all that. You didn't fill out resumes. You just showed up, and then you found out what we do. It's not like any other church I've ever been to. Uh, that's why I can't give you a resume. I can't tell you about camps. I can't tell you about, you know, toilets being stopped up, and financial issues, or things that take place, how kids are going to act, where you're going to put them, you know, when the summer comes, you lose your, your, your space. Uh, uh, I, but I, I know this, you too, for the last two years, have made the best of a great situation. Amen. You really have. You have an open door for ministry in this place. So I exhort you to do two things. Preach the word. Love the people. Everything else is just details. All that thing is filling your days, they just details. Love the people. Preach the word. That's what we're called to do. Leaders, use your ministry to build people. If you do, they'll become your pride and joy. They break your hearts just like we break theirs. But someday you'll, you'll meet them again. To the church, I say pray. Pray. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your pastor's wife. Her struggles are different. And I'm not an easy man to get along with. I'm insensitive. <laughs> pray for her. You have to. you are my reward it's an awesome privilege to pastor the congregation of the little country church and all that God's going to add to it I pray you'll have good health that God give you clear vision bold words servant's heart and much more I pray that God grants this church unity that when a little saint looks at me and says if I come there will there be gossip Lord, I pray she sets by the right person. <laughs> Unity, vision, conviction, brotherly love, passionate service, hearts on fire for God, and tenacious courage to do things for Christ and for his kingdom. What will be your joy? What will be your crown? Let it not be programs. But we got some good ones. Not our budget, even though it's important. Not our buildings. Though I think they're pretty good. Only two things will last forever. The word of God and people. Stand with me. When Jesus comes again. You will remember in these happy days. That we've ministered the word of God to the people. Not only at the little country church. But to the world. And that's going to last forever. Again, let me preface it. God's not against you having things. He's against things having you. Life is about balance, perspective, growth. But one day, we, it's going to happen. The skies will split. Whether you are in the ground, I always get tickled to people. Pastor, the Bible says we're going to meet him together in the air. But the scripture says those that are dead in Christ will rise first. Why do they get to rise first? Well, if you're six foot under and you're going to meet together in the air, you got to give them a head start. <laughs> There's so much common sense you just kind of miss out on when you don't think it through. <laughs> Somebody said it's going to be the Baptists that are going to heaven first. Because the scripture says the dead in Christ will rise. I, I'll leave that alone. I just, just want to throw that out there for you. You are my reward. So when I get there, and I'll be your reward. We, we, it's, it's, it's so much family. But I say it again. 
is a great place to get your illusions shattered. You have to come into the church world with a realism to know that everybody here needs God. They need more now than they ever had. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, my one concern about sharing this word is that it would come across somehow arrogant or pressure on people to, to do something that they're not called to do. God, I pray for freedom in this house. I pray for freedom to win people to you. I pray for the desire to understand that what I do here is going to matter, to reach people while there's time. Lord, this is not a, a call saying it's almost over in the next week or two. Again, like Paul said, which was thousands of years ago, the people here are the crown, the joy, the hope. God set the hope free. Let the hope go out from here. Connect with others. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're not confident that Jesus is your Savior, would you put your hand up so I can pray for you? If you're not confident, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let me pray with you. There's three hands up already. Those watching us by the Internet, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Become my Savior. I'll allow you to be my Lord. I thank you for washing away my past, redeeming my future, giving me a destiny, a hope, and a legacy. May what I do here ring through eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God a praise. Amen. Amen. To those that don't have a Bible, please stop by the bookstore. If you need one, we'll give you one. If you need anything out on that shelf there, you know, any of those teaching tapes, take what you want. All our stuff's now on the internet. You can go to holywild.tv now and just about pick up anything. It sure ruined tape sales. <laughs> Which is okay. Be seated for a brief moment. Our servant leaders to come up. Amen. David, why don't you make some of these announcements I've got up here because they show a lot of them. A lot of things going on. And I'll, I'll mention this one thing to you. This right here is what we're asking for. These are gift cards, $25 gift cards. And they are from a Walmart. And they're to help our kids. If you need one of these, uh, we'll let you know when it's going to happen. You'll see Cheryl but I don't know when the give out of these are for sure. But, but we're going to give these out to parents that need to buy supplies for their children to go back to school. We've often bought supplies and given them out. The problem with that is we end up stuck with rulers or paper or things like that for a whole year that people didn't need. So we want you to be able to, be, to go and purchase for your kids. So if you would pick up some of these and bring them to the church and make them available for us to give out a $25 gift card, That'd be a wonderful thing. And I think next Sunday after church, there's going to be a swim party out at the church. Matter of fact, Sister Tammy said this. If you want three hours without your kids, bring them out to the ranch. Just drop them off. <laughs> we'll take care of them. You'll get a, a mom and day's day out. The baptistry will be ready next week. If you want to be baptized, back in the bookstore, you'll see one of these cards. Fill it out. Put it on my desk for Tuesday or on the church office desk or leave it with... One of the ladies here, amen, and we'll get a certificate filled out for you. We'll baptize you next Sunday. The baptistry is ready, amen. The curtain's been pushed back. we set up. We're ready to baptize here, amen. If you need a tithe or offering envelope, lift your hand. Uh, we got your six meeting. That's with Mike and um, HUD. I don't see HUD here today, but uh, if, if you guys have been military, Got your six. That's Monday, um, first Monday of every month. This w this month it's going to be in New Caney. Uh, we got a TLCC Ladies Brunch and Devotional Saturday, August 12th, 10 a.m. at the Crosby campus. It says it's a potluck, so bring something to share. Marie, is there anything? Uh, oh, she she's not here, so 
Any, anything else anybody needs to share about that? Uh huh. Yeah, apparently something about the hotel, if they go on TLCC, they can actually book a room through TLCC rather than, if you call the church, they're already reserved through the church. If you call the hotel, and on their computer it's reserved because the church has already reserved them. So go through the website if you want to do that. Um, and that's going to be September 28th through the 30th. Uh, see flyers for details. Flyers are in the back. Uh, we have a swap meeting August 13th. In the fellowship hall after service, uh, that's next week, I believe, uh, August 13th, back to school swim party. That's what Pastor talked about next week, three hours, free babysitter. Yes, Lord. I wish my kids were old enough. Uh, August 19th, Jewels for Christ. Uh, that's Miss Diane Spurlock. See her. Uh, she'll be able to answer any questions you have, and that will be at the Crosby campus. August 20th, Cubs back to school promotion. Um, that's our kids' church. Um all the Cubs will be going to the new grade level, uh, classes 820, um, apparently August 20th in 2017. August 27th, 29th, 30th, Bishop Gary Oliver. Uh, pastor's really, really excited about having Bishop Gary. Um, he, he's, an, he's a really, really an amazing, gifted guy. Uh, he can sing very, very well. But I, I like Pastor's uh, <laughs> depiction of him he said he's a big cowboy when you hear this man you don't picture big cowboy i promise like i heard him a, a long time ago and then pastor bring him back up and i was like oh yeah i heard that guy and then i was like that's not the same picture i got in my mind so uh excited about having a uh, guest here uh love having the guests pastor always brings in men that that really men and women that speak into this house I really do. I, I, I so appreciate the fact that he makes sure that anyone that steps up on this pulpit is going to feed you guys. Not hurt him, but make sure that it builds this house. Amen. So I'm grateful for that. September 1st, TLCC Ladies and Lions, uh, Zion's Lions. Um, oh, that's apparently the last day. So that is September 1st. Yes, sir. To book it. That's the last day we can book. Okay. Yes, Lord. Today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. forgetfulness the chains of yesterday surround me I yearn for peace and rest I don't want to end up where you found me and it echoes in my mind keeps me away tonight I know you have cast my sin as far as the east is from the west and I stand before you now as, as though I've never sinned. Today I feel like I'm just one mistake away from you leaving me this way. Jesus, can you show me just how far the east is from the west? Cause I can't. storm I'm in. Today I feel like I'm just one mistake away from you leaving me this way. Jesus, can you show 
show me just how far the east is from the west. Cause I can't bear to see the man I've been rising up in me again. In the arms of your mercy I find rest. Cause you know just how far the east is from the west. From one scarred hand to the other. All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Pastor. Let's pray and be on our way. Precious Father God, today we're in here to celebrate one thing, and that's you, Father God, for your love and your mercy. Father God, today we thank you for our pastor and the symbiotic relationship we have with him. Father God, he allows us to love him as much as he loves us, and may we truly always do it. Father God, as we leave today, we're going to stop loving you the way we want to. Father, I pray that we'll leave the way we'll love you the way you want us to love you. We hear your words, Father God. Continue to watch over us until we meet again. It's in Jesus' precious name we say, amen.